thank you for joining me on another episode of She Leads Now podcast, where we help career and entrepreneurial women gain the tools to develop a success mindset, create winning strategies, build collaborative relationships, and take bold action towards creating impact and fulfillment in their lives and careers. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm on a mission to awaken and activate women and emerging leaders so they can tap into their innate leadership ability, elevate their influence, and create the impact they were destined to make. If you're ready to up-level your confidence, courage, and influence, you've come to the right place. Join me weekly for insights, strategies, and resources to help you grow, develop, and embody the leader you were meant to be so that you can make the impact you know you are called to make and establish the legacy you've always dreamed. The world eagerly awaits the emergence of your brilliance, impact, and influence. So with that, let's dive into this week's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of She Leads Now. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and I'm excited to bring you another installment of the Lead Her Ship Reloaded series, Reimagining, Redefining, and Rehumanizing Leadership. And so today I have another amazing guest. Yes, I say all of them are amazing because they are Alden Reynoso. Alden is an experienced employment professional with more than 25 years in the human resources field. Through her firm, HR Brain Trust Incorporated, she works across a variety of industries to provide clients with employee and leadership development training and human resources compliance consulting services. With that, welcome to the show, Alden. Thank you so much, Sabine. I'm happy to be here. Ah, excited to have you. Okay, so you've been in the game for a very long time. And and what I didn't share here is that you also um, are a faculty and we're going to speak to a little bit of what that looks like in training the next generation of leaders. But before we get into that, walk us through your career journey and some of the actions you took and decisions that you made that led you into the space that you're in today. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like I don't, are you familiar with the comic strip series, Family Circle? No. Oh, it's, it's, it's old. I'm dating myself by even mentioning it. There's a little boy named Billy in it. And sometimes the, the comic traces his path home. And it's always this very securitous dotted line between where he started and where he's supposed to be. And it winds around in circles. And I feel like that's kind of what's happened with my career. When I graduated high school and I started out in my um, undergraduate education, I was actually gearing it toward being an elementary school teacher. I was, uh, I went to Northern Arizona University because at the time they had, I don't know if it's still true, but they had a a top rated program in early child in, in elementary school for teacher education. And that was my path. I was, I worked my way through high school and college teaching preschool. And so I felt very much that that was where I was drawn. And along the way, I kind of uh, fell out of it. Actually, my dad kind of talked me out of it, talked me into a different path. And so I ended up with this degree in liberal studies because I couldn't pick what to what to major in. (laughs) But I was interested in everything. So I took a lot of classes and then I went to graduate school. I was actually in a doctorate program in psychology up at UC Santa Cruz. And a couple of years into that, I decided that being a university professor was not for me. (laughs) Because <laughs> that's the path I was on, right? I was going to be a researcher and a professor um, studying developmental psychology and specifically how we solve problems. That was my area of interest is problem solving. And at the end of that, my mom said to me, she says, since you know you're not going to get the doctorate now, you might be interested in a career in human resources. And I looked at her and I said, mom, my whole life, all I've ever heard you talk about is stupid HR. Stupid HR is, is come up with this new rule or stupid HR is doing this thing. Why do I want to be stupid HR? <laughs> and she says, well, I think you'd be good at it. <laughs> so um, I was very, very fortunate. I had an amazing mentor, um, Ana Maria Grace, if I can call her out by name. <laughs> um, 
And she kind of took me under her wing and introduced me into her network and helped me get my first job in human resources, which was actually in technical recruiting. And that's where I started. I had a, I'd had a job um, doing compensation planning, which kind of wasn't clicking for me, but I really enjoyed the recruiting and did that for several years, technical recruiting at the height of the dot-com boom. Had to kind of reinvent myself from that when I started having kids. And I really wanted to have a job that let me both be a parent and still be an active career-minded woman. And so that's when I started working for myself and being a consultant. It was in the, we're talking about like 99, 2000 timeframe. And that's when I started getting into HR proper and, and doing the consulting work. And I did that for a number of years. I had a stint where I went and worked full time for a client, a defense contractor in Carlsbad. That was a very positive experience. I learned lots. I was there for a number of years, almost 10 actually, before I went back to consulting again. And in 2017 is when I moved back to consulting and I haven't looked back since then. Until yeah. I until you until I met USK, and <laughs> now I'm on on staff at USK too. But. <laughs> nice, thank you That's for walking through that. So I'm curious, what as you obviously started to build your family and recognize that you needed a little bit more flexibility and wanted to create that balance. Did you start your company while you were still working full time, or did you do one of those like complete breaks and leaps straight into consultancy? I, I had, when, after I'd had my first child, I, my employer let me come back part-time. So I was working part-time and being a part-time stay-at-home mom. And I quickly recognized that I was going to hit a, a ceiling it, as grateful as I was to that employer to let me do that it very quickly became obvious to me that my opportunity for advancement within the organization was gonna be limited if I only wanted to work 20 hours a week. So I actually at that time was working on my certificate in HR management through UCSD. And one of my professors, I had approached her and said, hey, I have an interest. I was actually, what I wanted to work in was HRIS because that was new at the time because the internet was relatively new. And she says, well, then you really want to be a consultant. And I know a couple of people who just started an HR consulting firm. So I interviewed with a lo local firm, human resources professional group at the time. It's, it's no longer in business now, but I interviewed there and they offered me the consulting opportunity. So I took a leap of faith. And I just quit. I quit my regular job job. And I said, this is what I'm doing now. Yeah. And that was scary <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but it, I just knew it was right. I, in the center of me, I knew it was right. And I did it. And it, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you bring up a good point about how the career driven woman, whether that's an entrepreneurship or traditional environments, right? They, they, there are challenges there and there are opportunities as well. But one of the things that you mentioned is, as we know, a lot of women had to leave the workforce or made the decision to leave the workforce as a result of right. the pandemic. And even prior to the pandemic, there was always this, um, there was always this battle, if you will, for women in terms of trying to prioritize family, trying to prioritize their sure. careers and whatnot. And so a lot of people, a lot of women in particular, were leaving the workforce well before the great resignation, um, and they've come back. And now we have the women who have left as a result of the great resignation, either starting their own businesses or going back to corporate. Right. But what we don't talk about often enough is, Yes, these are decisions are being made, but there are consequences that stay yeah. with women as a result of making these decisions um, and prioritizing family over work. Um, and in your case, it sounds like you recognized it and God sent you an opportunity that right, was right, able to right. sustain you in that point. 
Um, but I also know that there are a lot of women who are facing, facing that challenge or facing even the guilt of, I, I want to advance in my career, but I want to love my kids and I want to be there yes. for them. Um, so I'm curious, even in your process of transition, like what were, what were some of the things that you used as anchors to help support you in being able to balance both home and your career? Wow. Well, I, I was blessed. Like I said, I had some excellent mentors, women who had been there before me and were willing to reach back and open some doors. And then I felt like I could go to, and I made free and easy use of those, right? I recognized them for being valuable assets. Um, and I, I recognized early that I didn't necessarily need to do it all, all by myself. I was also, I have to say, blessed with this amazing spouse. And he has always been very, very supportive. Um, and having those open and honest conversations about what do we both want and where are we both headed? So I have to say that. Um, and of course, God, we're going to have to talk about God at some point that I came to Christ shortly after I was married. And so being able to make these decisions prayerfully, that is absolutely an anchor for me to, to help move me forward within myself coming to realize and trust myself that I'm going to make good decisions, that I'm smart and capable, and I'm going to make good choices and coming to trust myself that I, I don't know that there's any substitute for that. We were talking a little while ago about emotional intelligence, and I do quite a bit of training and emotional intelligence. And I, that's one of the things that I emphasize in those trainings with people is you, you can't be afraid of your own feelings. You do have to be willing to acknowledge them and look at what you're bringing to the table. And when I talk about conflict resolution, sometimes that morphs into what am I doing to contribute to the problem and kind of owning that and having that be okay. But that, I think that, that sense of willingness to be inter reflect internally and think about what I'm thinking and feeling that that's important yeah. for growth, for personal growth. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what I heard for you was that one, you leveraged your network, right? Recognizing that you had <laughs> yeah, built this, this yep. network. And more importantly, you weren't afraid to ask for support. You weren't afraid to ask for them to open doors and support you in, in this process. And then the key one is definitely learning to trust yourself. I mean, we, we are a society that like looks to other people and looks to things externally all the time to validate us or to reinforce for us what we, what right. we need and learning to trust yourself and, and learning to hear that small, still voice that gives direction that takes intentionality. That takes practice. Right. That takes a willingness to surrender and to move away from all the noise so that you can hear your own truth speaking back to you right. so that you can hear the instructions that you need to move forward. So I, I right. appreciate you sharing that and bringing that into the conversation, because I, I do think that 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 is part of this whole process of growth and of absolutely learning. because otherwise things just happen to you right? <laughs> and you react to them. It's, it's building that sense of, of internal comfort with your internal sense of self and, and being able to listen for instruction, right? That that's what it enables you to be intentional in yeah. your actions. Absolutely. And so you mentioned the, the work that you do in terms of emotional intelligence training and social intelligence and one of the things that have, has been kind of circling in my mind is this notion around what it looks like for us to stay in our own power and respond to things that come before right. us, whether it's problems, challenges, whatever, versus reacting to it. Again, right. depending on where you are in life, like we may be in a situation or an environment where, you know, if you've ever worked in one of those, I won't call them toxic environments, but environments right, with very right, little right. structure, it's like <laughs> everything yeah. is urgent and you're constantly moving around and you don't even recognize that a lot of the things that you do or decisions that you make are on autopilot. 
versus when you can be centered and you can trust yourself and you can listen to that voice, you can respond to things either in the moment or proactively. And so I'd love to yeah. hear your thoughts based on the work that you do. If someone is not in that place where they have built the, the muscles, if you will, of responding right. to things versus reacting, right. what are some of the first initial things that they can do to start to learn that skill for themselves? So a great just day-to-day -day exercise that you could do is periodically during the course of your day, it's going to sound kind of a little frou-frou, but take out a piece of paper and just stop and make a note about how you're feeling. How am I feeling in this moment? What's the, what time is it? It's, it's 1.25 in the afternoon and I'm feeling a little tired and a little stressed because I'm feeling the weight of all the stuff I have yet to accomplish today. <laughs> it's, it's looming over me. It's kind of avalanche, right? Just, just acknowledge it because that's the very, very first step. I'm feeling stressed. Okay, now I can break it down. What is it that I'm feeling stressed? Well, I'm feeling stressed because I have this huge inbox and frequently... If you start thinking it through, you're going to find that you're feeling stressed because you're, you're, you're trapped in a negative mindset and a catastrophic mindset that's really related to kind of the situation in which you find yourself and the people you feel like you have to quote unquote deal with, right? And things that I say to clients <laughs> as I'm helping them unpack all these feelings and things, I mean, not that I'm a... a a psychiatrist or a licensed therapist, but it comes up, right? When you're coaching clients, these kinds of conversations come up. Like people, other people do what they do because of them, not because of you. And they're going to have as much power over you as you give them. So if you are keeping focused on what's going on inside your head and your brain, and you're making sure that when you I love the distinction between respond and react. When you respond to it, that you're doing it based on objective reality and not based on the narrative or the story that you've told yourself about what's going on on the outside, it's going to end in a, a more positive result. Did I answer your question? You did, did. you did actually. And you, you just okay. gave me, um, you brought something to, to mind a couple of weeks ago. I was having this moment where, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, like, right, one day you are on this high and like, you just have all this pro productivity and creativity and like things are getting done. And then the next day or two days later, it's kind of like, I've got nothing. <laughs> I'm sitting yeah. here at this yeah. desk, but <laughs> I've got nothing. And then even in those moments, um, to the point that you were making about asking, how are you feeling? I have started... I don't, I don't write it down, but that's a, probably a really good thing for me to include. But I will sit there and ask myself, what are you feeling, Sabine? Are you feeling right. overwhelmed? Is this fear? Like I force myself, not force myself, that, that seems a little forceful, but I, I try to identify and name what the emotion is because there's that's a exactly power. Yeah. yeah, there's a power in separating you, your identity from the emotion that you're feeling, right? right? Because when you can separate those two, then you can look at it objectively of, oh, okay, to your point about the inbox, right? Oh, my inbox is full. All right, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Okay, what am I feeling overwhelmed about? And then the third piece is usually this, this it, I don't know about you, but it always goes back for me of an area where I have one, not made a decision, or two, not set a boundary. And so the oh, emotions the that I'm feeling, yes. <laughs> yes, they're reflective really of what I have agency over. Like the external okay. stuff, it's real, it's happening. Don't get me wrong. But I somehow gave away my power in a situation, right. or at least that's what I'm recognizing for me. I yeah. somehow gave away my power or didn't exercise it. Hence why I'm feeling overwhelmed or whatever else. It's so true. And I'm going to tell you, I am experiencing it this today because I am trying to corral my inbox, right? Triage my inbox so that I can go on vacation because I want to take next week off. So I had made myself a list. These things need to get accomplished before I can go. 
and I have my list and I'm checking things off my list. Well, then somebody called me with a crisis and I had to abandon my list because it was urgent. And then, but then I have to go back and reevaluate my list. And now it's okay. I'm clearly not going to get through all this. So then I have to ask myself how much of the sense that I'm feeling that I need to accomplish all these things before Friday morning is coming from me and how much of it is actually coming because the client has requested it. So then I'm reevaluating my list and it's amazing how much stuff you can just cross off. Like I didn't promise that. They're not expecting that. Why am I putting the pressure on me to do that? We're not delivering babies here. It's not brain surgery. It's, right. That can wait. So to yeah. your point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 amazing. We all do it. We all experience it. it yeah. Speaking about the list and, and I'll move on here. It's like I've been doing this this exercise every morning of writing down the things that I, I want. And as someone who is so familiar or comfortable with making lists, I have found yeah. over time that lists are not my friend. I in in one season or multiple seasons of my life that mode of operation was great for me, right? To be able to write it down first thing in the morning and to cross right, it right. off and look at this piece of paper with all of these scribbles that used to excite me. <laughs> now <laughs> that annoys me. Um, and so I've gotten to a place where starting in, in the new year, as I'm, as I'm asking my mind to help me <laughs> in executing this, right, is right. picking one priority, just one priority for the day as an entrepreneur, it's like, there's so much that we can and that we should do. And there's always this pressure of, I need to fill my day. And I don't know the yeah. something about this year. I need to justify the fact that I'm self-employed. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so now it's like, you pick one priority, you work on that priority and that's your only focus. That's the only pressure, quote unquote, pressure you're putting on yourself. If you have time and if you have energy and if you have capacity, then you can move right. to the next thing. But it's not this um, it's not this overwhelming feeling that we're placing on ourselves, which isn't fair because right. it, you we know if it were someone else would be like, you got to put your mask on first. Or right. why we do would we tell not them, give ourselves grace? Yes. <laughs> give yourself some grace. <laughs> I, I I repeatedly say that and repeatedly. Yeah deny myself grace. Um, so yeah. we're on the same page and, and, and thank you for, thank you for highlighting that and how you're applying it. Um, of course, as you're listening, you know, this is a work in progress, right? All of these things that we're sharing, it takes intentionality. It takes time. Um, it takes the awareness for you to even recognize that this is the pattern of behavior that is not working for me. And there are other options or there are other things that you can do and apply. Um, as we're, as we're thinking about the concept around leadership reloaded and what it looks like to reimagine, redefine and rehumanize leadership. I know that you work, um, at the university and you are at the forefront of shaping the minds of <laughs> yes. our future leaders. And as we know, our current leaders, they need some help. They need some support. And, and we got people who are in place to do that, but you are actually doing the work of starting to sow the seeds so that when they get into the workforce or when they start their own businesses, that they're doing it from a place of strong identity, that they're doing it with the skills skill sets that are actually needed to succeed in the real world, quote unquote, and, um, and in the workforce. Yeah. So I'm curious as you're, as you've been working with these students and as you've been in the space of academia, what are you seeing right now today as potential gaps and opportunities for leaders who are in positions of leadership today to be ready and prepared for, to support the leaders that are coming into the organizations? Yeah, this, I, yeah, so I, I love the work that I do with the University of St. Catherine, and thank you so much for, for bringing that up, because I'm always happy to talk about it. It is a, a passion of mine, is the work I do there. So it may be a little shocking <laughs> for people to hear this, but I think as educators and adults shepherding in the next generation into the workforce, we collectively are doing a really lousy job of preparing our students for failure. I see this over and over again. We teach them goal setting. We teach them to strive to climb the mountain. 
We stand beside behind them with the, the carrot on the stick to encourage them to go up that slope. What we fail to do, ironically, is to prepare them for how to climb out of the pit. Because you know, at some point they're going to lose their footing, they're going to slip and fall, and they're going to fail. And we don't give them a lot of room to do that because we're creating this like achievement culture, right? That you have to be achieved. You have to do it's when you're in the classroom, that's a safe place to fail. So I think that we should be talking to students and new grads about what's your plan for when you screw up? How are you going to break down that experience, take lessons learned from it? grow as a person, grow professionally and move forward and not internalize it and make that one failure define you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Is that oh, absolutely. Just, absolutely. So I just, I feel like that that's something that, that the next, that we need as we're reaching back to, to the next generation that we're helping them prepare for their eventual pit. Where's the rope? How are you going to haul yourself out of that? Yeah, it, it's it's funny that you say that. And I mean, it, it's unfortunate that that's where our students are. But is that not also reflective of where the adults are? Right. Like yeah. the adults who are raising. Because these... we're not giving ourselves grace. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Back like to point no, <laughs> no margin of error. Like this, this perfectionist highlight reel society that we have become doesn't allow, doesn't always allow people to see the real, the behind the scenes, the right. cradle in the corner, fetal position right, exactly. <laughs> moment yeah. that we have. And I've shared this uh, quite often on, on this podcast and, and through other means, but I didn't know what failure was until I stepped into entrepreneurship. I, when I say that, it doesn't mean that I did not fail in the past. It does not mean that I didn't make mistakes in the past. It was the part of me that would not allow me to see it, recognize and accept it as failure and right. seeing it as an opportunity for me to learn and grow. Whereas in the past, the mindset was, I got to try harder, right? There came the inner critic, like, you're not good enough. You need to try harder. You right. need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. And I never allowed myself to sit in failure and to sit in the feelings of talking about the emotional intelligence until right. entre entrepreneurship, where it's like, if you're not failing, you're not growing, right? It is part exactly. of the job description <laughs> that you must be okay <laughs> with failure. Um, and so that was, that was, that's been a transition for me. It's still a transition. If I'm being quite honest, yeah. because I'm reprogrammed 30 plus years of programming. So as we're talking about these students who are in school coming into the workforce, I think right now, as of the time of this recording, 2022, Gen Z is about 5% of the workforce. Um, and I think obviously millennials are, are the highest, but they're coming in to the workforce. They're in the workforce and they're going to keep coming in. And what we're seeing is that not only do we have present leaders who have not been prepared to lead, um, they're not prepared to lead the next generation, right? So it's, not only in this moment are they trying to find their footing on what it means to be great leaders, but they are also not equipped or they haven't been equipped in all fairness. They have not been equipped to support the next generation in the space that they need. So I, I love the fact that you've brought the, the piece around getting okay with failure um, and being okay right. with it and, and learning to lean into it. Um, I'm curious though, as we think about we think about failure, right? Like we think about failing a class, right? Or right. not winning a championship game um, in, in their context. I'm, I'm trying to take myself back to that. Like Pretty what right, would right, failure right, have right. meant to me? So I know that that varies. What are some of the things that we can start to instill? So we, we know that we need to support them in accepting and processing and dealing with failure. Um, but what are some of the things that we can begin to instill or, or better yet, what are some of the things that you're instilling in them to help them get to that place? Well, so 
The way I explain, and I explain this too in, in training, when I do training on um, conflict resolution, I talk about this idea a lot too, that you're always going to approach failure with a problem-solving mindset. And if you have a problem-solving mindset, it's not about blame and looking to see whose fault it is. That, that this is here because we all, that just kind of triggers our emotional response that we all have to, to be right. Like we need to be right. Cause it's not about your need to be right. It's about accepting what is and then starting to break it down into the component parts. I mean, certainly you have to own your mistakes because there's power and personal accountability. Um, I have, I encourage students to kind of reframe the mindset and and have it be like, given that my goal is to you know, perform well in my class, what is the very, very next best thing I can do? Like I'm right now, right here in this class, I have a C minus and I wanna get it up to a B. What's the next thing I could do? Well, I need to ask my professor for help. I need to go to office hours, find out those, those resources are and then use them. I need to go back and study <laughs> <laughs> study for the final. I need to ask who are my resources for extra help. Can I go into the tutoring center? Is that an option that's available to me? You just have to state your goal and then figure out what is the next positive action you can take toward working toward it, but do it without saying, oh, the professor grades too hard. Oh, the text is unclear. Oh, it was a miscommunication. You just kind of have to accept things for where they are. And you can go back and reflect on it for lessons learned, of course, but just making sure that it doesn't become about blame. Whose fault is it that I'm in these untenable circumstances? Because sometimes things fall into the category of not your fault, just your problem. And you're going to have to get out of it one way or the other anyway. So yeah. you can do everything right and still fail. Right. And so I, what I'm hearing is personal accountability and personal responsibility are foundational, period. Yeah, it's absolutely. just absolutely It's empowering, there. right? Because if you're taking personal accountability for a situation, then you're saying, okay, what is the next thing I can do? because this is on me to fix, right? Doesn't matter how we got here. I'm gonna drive it forward. What's the next thing I can do? And that's empowering. It is. I would argue. <laughs> it absolutely is. <laughs> and there's always an opportunity, even in, in doing that and breaking down. I, I think about, and I've taught on SMART goals for a very long time. I think as I, as I take a step back and I'm like, I've been questioning, <laughs> let's just, let me just say that I've been questioning how, how valid is this model and this formula that is so widespread that we teach at all different levels. I mean, I understand the logic behind it. Right. Um, but at the same time, how can I put this? there's still an opportunity. I feel like that's not the end all and the be all of how to set goals and how to get where you need to, because so much of the human experience and the components and the elements of being a person with emotions or having things get scheduled and like the contingencies, if you will, um, or thinking through what is your sabotage pattern? Like what might stop you? Right. Yeah. Oh, so I taking, love that sabotage pattern. Yeah. So taking the smart <laughs> goals process, I feel like there's room and there's opportunity to expand it so that it doesn't become this thing that makes people feel limited or that what they're striving towards is impossible, but that you're adding the human elements and the human components in there. Right. So it's that like it adding a grace. little eye in front of the smart, right? I smart goals. <laughs> Because it's like that internal piece. It's the I piece. It's the, right? Yeah. And the I comes through you know, each fun. each one of those, really, right? Yeah. So setting the goals is one thing, right? Determining that you're going to sit down once a week to measure progress. That's another thing. There's room probably to take multiple tools or resources and put them together to help people yeah. go from where they are to where they want to be. So it's just like when you define your SMART goal, you also need to define how you're going to hold yourself accountable for, yeah. for your SMART goal in a way that also creates grace. 
because don't forget to give yourself some grace, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like if I if I fail to achieve this smart smart goal within my timeline, I will give myself some grace. Yeah. Reset it, revisit it. And I'll share one thing and then and we can move on to the blitz section. The at the time of this recording, it's the end of the year. So I'm planning out my strategic planning and, and goals for for 2023, the following year. And so as I'm obviously setting my milestones and doing all the things that you're supposed to do, one of the things that I've been intentional about this time around is trying, and I mentioned my sabotage patterns, right? So for me, as I'm defining sabotage patterns, what are the things that when they come up, they will cause you to stop, they will cause you to stew in fear, or they might cause you to abandon your process towards meeting your goals. And for me, I've recognized feeling overwhelmed is a, is a trigger for procrastination. Right. And so now I know as I was planning out my goals and kind of planning out what the milestones are, I had to ask myself, Sabine, is this too much? Are you going to feel overwhelmed? And in those, in those times where I was like, yeah, I probably will. I removed it or I shifted or I pivoted. Um, Another sabotage pattern for me is in times of disappointment, right? So here I've planned out, let's just say this launch, right? What happens if I don't get those numbers? I'm going to be disappointed. So what, what is my reprieve, right? How am I going to get over the disappointment? What am I going to put in place, right? So I'm already putting measurements in place and all this other stuff so that I know, not that I'm planning for disappointment, But I know if and when I'm disappointed, it doesn't create the situation where I'm like stepping away from for a couple of days because I just need to get my mind right. It's more of, okay, I'm disappointed, but here are these things that I plan for ahead of time to keep me moving towards the goal. Um, So for those who are listening, hopefully that gives you a clearer picture of how do you put this into practice? How do you take those small goals and those ambitions that you have and the things that you want to achieve and and impact that you want to make? How do you also incorporate what you need to succeed in addition to the goal itself? That's great. I know. And I know that you and I have talked before about the um, touch it once, get it out of your inbox. I also have, I jokingly refer to it as Alden's little notebook of big ideas. (laughs) I have a one note, one note notebook that I keep that if I have this idea for another service, another training, another something that I want to put out there into the world, I'll just make a note of it. It doesn't mean I have to take action on it right away. I just don't want to forget that I had that great idea. I'm going to stay focused on uh, my planned action items that are goal oriented, right? Working toward driving myself where I want to be. So, but those things have worked for me. I love that understanding your sabotage triggers. Cause I think mine are very similar to yours and I just, I can't, I can't have that inbox get too fat yeah. or I just go, Ugh, I'm not going to get it all done anyway. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm done here today. Thank you for sharing that. So as we shift, yeah. right. As you think about your experience, your lived experiences, right. And in, in the paths that you started on and then kind of pivoted career wise. And now even the work that you're doing today, As you look back, is there a piece of advice or is there one thing that if you could go back to a younger version of yourself and and share with her that you feel would have been a game changer or or certainly something that she could have taken away to help her succeed or advance? Absolutely. And, And I think it all comes back to knowing yourself and trusting yourself that you are going to make a good choice. Because if you look at the path that my career take, I actually am kind of like ending right where I started. As much as I love what I do now at the university and how passionate I am about that work, think about that's almost 25 years ago. That's where I was headed, but it's taken this long. I mean, and some of it is just that it all happens at God's good time and to his purpose. At the same time, if I had just listened to myself and trusted myself and not external factors, I would have been doing it for a lot longer, really. So 
Trust yourself. And then looking forward, right? As you're, as you're continuing to build and you're continuing to evolve in this place, in this version of your identity, when you look back, right? Over your life, over your yep. contributions, over your impact. What do you want the narrative to be? What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, I would really like people to, the, the people I've come in contact and influenced, what I'd like them to, to kind of take away from that is that you need to be genuine and meet people where they are. Understanding that everybody defines success differently and you have to respect that. I think that's coming back to point A, know yourself. Like, because if your definition of success isn't power and money, that is okay. Because that's your definition of success. It doesn't have to be somebody, meet somebody else's, right? So I would want my legacy to be that I recognized people as individuals and I respected their own definition of success. So I'm curious, are there any books or is there one book that has been truly pivotal for you in your growth, in your development, either personally or professionally? Well, I, I don't know about truly pivotal, but it was very, very impactful. It's something that stayed with me and that I implement the tactics of all the time. So it's Sherry Harley's How to Say Anything to Anyone. It's about being candid in our conversations. And again, I just said, I want to be genuine. I want to be open. I want to be honest. Right. So this plays into that. It's just really, if, even if you have something that's hard to say, how do you say it, get it out there and have open dialogue with somebody about it so that everybody can move forward. And it's great. It's been great, especially for conflict resolution, how to say anything to anyone. All right. We'll definitely include it. We'll include the link to Amazon in the show notes. And of course, Alden, as people are listening and they want to connect with you either for your emotional intelligence training or support with helping them teach their children how to fail appropriately, <laughs> how, can, how can they get in touch with you? Um, best way is via email, um, areynoso at usk.edu for if it's college related, university related, or um, for my consulting work, it would be Alden at hrbraintrustinc.com. Awesome. And you do a virtual and in-person trainings on the emotional and yes, social I intelligence? Do. Yes, I am conversant in Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I could, I could do both. Definitely. Okay. Love it. And as for social, where do you, where's your hangout spot? Oh, where do I go to socialize? In terms oh, on of, social uh, media. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm not hip. Right. So LinkedIn, I'm find me on LinkedIn. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, I, 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 you're assuming I have a social life. <laughs> so with that, thank you again for coming on, for sharing your wisdom, your examples. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing with our future leaders, right? We need more and more leaders who are reaching back out to support those who are coming into the space because we know leadership today and the expectations of how to be is so drastically different than what it was when we were growing up. And so I truly yeah. believe any support that these, uh, I'm going to say youngsters and sound old, any support that these youngsters can get in terms <laughs> of giving them a leg up, um, always happy to support that. So with that, we will be back next week with another amazing woman in leadership. Have a great rest of the week and we will talk soon. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of She Leads Now. If you found today's episode helpful or got a piece of insight that you plan to implement in your business or organization, I would love to hear from you. Connect with me on LinkedIn at Sabine Gideon, that's my handle, and send me a private message or feel free to go ahead and leave a review on either Apple or Spotify. I also invite you to share this episode with anyone in your network who you think might benefit from this content. Lastly, be sure to check the show notes and the description below for links to resources, including relevant downloads, articles, and any upcoming training. Until we chat again, have a blessed and powerful week.